I see you found our little hiding spot in the universe. Don't get too comfortable. This is a place where you will find those with an experience that's out of this world. Or possibly deep within your life. I welcome you to the Oracles with James Tyson. Lean forward and listen. We will pull you into a supernatural journey with guests from around the world, each one experiencing some of the most extraordinary phenomena this wee planet has to offer. Now, here are the Oracles with James Tyson. Thank you, Liam, and thank you, listener, for tuning into this episode of the Oracles with James Tyson. Tis I, James Tyson, and today I introduce you to Lori Wheeler. She is a practitioner of holistic medicine, a number of modalities, um, homeopathic medicine, uh, oh my gosh, flower essence, uh, rife therapy I want to talk to her about, um, and also she introduces people to their own journeys of discoveries. Shamanic journeying and coaching is the ability to create in the unknown, is known by shamans around the world. She also does past life regression and something called lives between lives we're going to talk about. She does medical intuition, soul retrieval, takes you through your Akashic Records. If you want to follow along with us, go to wellnesswithin.net. Again, that's wellnesswithin.net. It's the easiest way to get to her uh, website. And you'll see all the different things that uh, Lori actually does. She's out of New Mexico. And if you're ever interested in getting a hold of her, you can get a hold of her on her website. She does offer a free 20-minute consult, which can be scheduled over the phone. And yes, this can happen over the phone. It is a lot more, mm, I don't want to say mainstream, but it's getting to be used a lot now as we kind of move into a understanding that energy and sound can heal someone. Uh, it does affect our well-being. Uh, very nice lady, and I want to introduce you to her now. Lori, how are you? I am very well. Thank you, James. <laughs> it was it was wonderful meeting you at AlienCon down in Los Angeles this year. Uh, you and your partner there who was selling those really cool houses that uh, you can pretty well build into the side of a mountain or build them anywhere. That was, that was really interesting. Yeah. And, and um, also what you do and uh, your involvement in homeopathy and the various uh, modalities that, that fall from that. When did you start getting into this? Um, I'm going to just say 25 plus years because I can't remember the exact date I started to get involved. Um, and I, I became involved um, – due to my own health and illness. Um, do you want me to explain a little bit what happened? Uh, it might be, might be helpful. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So back in 89, um, with my first husband and my family of four children and myself, we built a house. And we built a house on land in upper New York State. And um, what happened was we became contaminated from the well water. And the, we, we lived near a chemical plant, which was leaching into the aquifer, which our land was, our house was, we built on top. Um, we had all kinds of chemicals. We had a um, crop duster would fly over, uh, all kinds of problems, if you can just imagine. And this I found out through a lot of research because we became ill, all of us in the family things were not right and we were fine before we moved in so you know as a matter of being like a Sherlock Holmes and trying to uncover where is this coming from first we thought maybe it was the house and, and such and so long story short um, I actually had the town and then I had the county come in and test water and they found some contamination um, and so then we did some things to clean things up, but the damage, so to speak, physically was done at that point. Now, I'm just going to say simultaneous to that, 
things started to unravel in a spiritual way in my home also. And so uh, we can kind of get to that later if, if you want, but it was a whole grand happening for all of us and um, meant to be, but really tough on, on all of us at the same time. So then I started to look into different modalities of how to heal myself because I went through traditional medicine and could not find an answer. Um, they, thought it was Lyme disease, they thought it was all kinds of problems and and different for each of us, didn't get a good answer. So finally, one day, I just threw my hands up and said, I have to find a different way. And that was really the beginning of the opening of everything. And um, then I went into alternative methods. I started with chiropractic, went into acupuncture, did acupuncture for a very long time, only could take me to a certain level and and with some healing. And then from there, I went into homeopathy. And I just kind of went to a homeopath, um, and we could see our health was getting better. And I wanted to know more about what this was that was helping us. I didn't really understand it. So I started to study it, and that's what really took me into deciding that I really – I actually made a pact – with the higher source and I said if I really can find an answer that can really help us heal I want to do this and I want to offer this to other people and then here I am <laughs> here you are oh, yeah uh, many moons later did you have any right. um, conflict or and I shouldn't say conflict but uh, did you have the your doctors and your mainstream medical personnel kind of raise an eyebrow when you were kind of moving away from what they were doing into what you ended up or how you well separated. you know what happened was I just kind of walked away from it I you know it was the kind of thing where they could see nothing was really changing and at that point I just made a decision for the family for my children who were younger at the time and I just said we've got to do something different I started to search and find an answer and the homeopathy was definitely clearly making a difference. And so it didn't really matter what, you know, the doctors at that point said, because mm -hmm. I was going to do what I felt was right for my family. So it's very common, uh, out in, on the West coast here or British Columbia in, in Canada, back in the nineties, uh, a lot of the builders started building things with what was called a California, um, stucco. And, mm -hmm. It would probably work great in, in Southern California, but up here because the wood mm. uh, and it, it's moist air and the house didn't breathe. Mm. So it developed mold. So mm. we had the sick home syndrome. We had stachybotrys mold growing in the houses. People didn't realize it until like their small pets died or they mm. were, you know, constantly fatigued and you know, they they would phone in and, and stay home sick from work, not realizing that it was the home that was hurting them. They would have been healthier if they actually gone to work. So we did go through a lot of that out here, and a lot of those people, over time, they, um, you know, dealing with the mainstream medical uh, way of, deal of being healthy, uh, they, a lot of them did break off and go into the uh, homeopathy side of things, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm very familiar. That was something we explored, actually. And I have worked with many people now in my practice that have um, incurred the mold syndrome, so to speak, and the problems that lie, you know, uh, in their physical body from it. And so I'm really familiar with it and I know how destructive it can be. But that was not the case for us. We had chemical um a poisoning actually yeah. is what it was and from there uh, you know later on I learned that we had to do some detoxing some cleaning out it just really destroyed the digestive system my husband at the time almost lost the lining of his stomach um, all kinds of things that I had never heard of before you know, before this problem. So one, it educated me um, because I'm a research person. If I don't have an answer, I'm going to get to the bottom of the answer. And then we actually did find, or I found that um, in the research, I actually found that 
for a mile radius or more, there were many people in the area that were sick. So then I could hold a, a, a gathering of people. And, uh, you know, I, I was like the advocate for people that were sick in the area because I was about finding an answer. And so my answer, le- you know, turned me to, um, um, uh, Oh, I lost my train of thought to homeopathy, to Mm -hmm. um, complementary medicine. And um, but that was what I was supposed to do. This is my destiny for sure. And that was what brought me into it. That was the purpose. So, yeah, you you needed the legs kicked out from you (laughs) to uh, get your your spiritual attention up. Uh, Now, yeah. What were some of the actual things you ended up doing to help the family? What types of um well, I'm going to have to say it. What kind of remedies um, did you end up uh, finding help the best? Are, are you saying homeopathic remedies? Yes. Um, so here's the thing with homeopathy. It is very individualized medicine. And um, it it's the kind of medicine that you must sit with a person for a period of time, could be one to two hours, and take a history of that whole person. So each person in the family is different. We're all different. Um, like the fingerprint of, of your, of your thumb or whatever. And, um, so what makes one person, even though it's one substance or substances that make us all sick, each person's reaction was different. And due to the reaction, that's how, or symptoms, that's how you find a, a well-chosen remedy that matches. So homeopathy is based on the um, understanding and principles of like cures like. So if you take a whole person and on the mental, emotional, and physical levels, and this person is sort of slow to function and um, sleepy in the morning, and this person has stomach uh, disorders and, you know, a whole host of things, whereas another person in the family could be more hyper and they could be have a lack of uh, attention and focus. And so, yes, it was the same uh, problem that happened to them, but it it addresses in a different way for each person. And so each person required a different homeopathic medicine to help them heal. Yeah, it's, I was uh, off in on the big island of Hawaii uh, mm. a few weeks ago, and I stayed at a place called, or I visited a place called the Dragonfly Ranch, which isn't what it, it appears. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, familiar. Uh, we oh, okay. used to live there. We used to live in Hawaii oh. on Big Island. Yes, oh, right. I called so you. Uh-huh. I was talking to uh, Barbara Moore, who runs it. She and her mother started it 45 some years ago. But sure. she gave me a book on um dieting and by blood mm. type so mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. you know she really kind of narrowed it down just what you said that it is an individual it um it, it's very individual and each of us has our own um way of being our own bodies our own way of processing things so yes uh, yes sit, <laughs> sit down with your yeah sit down with somebody and kind of go through a checklist of the different things and and at least it's not uh, it in homeopathy. It's not um, a, a very very invasive thing. If if if, if remedy A doesn't work, it's not going to kill you. It's, no, exactly <laughs> we'll just go not. To B and see right. D. Yeah. Right. Um, right. So did, so it is individualized, and that comes from um, several aspects. One, your your heritage. You know, what what um, your father, your grandfather, your great grandfather, what's within the history of your family genetics, you know, and what sort of may even be dormant. So here's an example. Somebody that's 35 years old, I may be taking the case they and I will always ask a history, but I will also always ask about dreams and and things like that. So you want to know a complete understanding and profile of that individual. But this person may not have cancer, but it doesn't mean that they couldn't get it when they were 70 years old because it's in the genetic makeup of that person. So a remedy may be given to try to help peel off and 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 um, 
relieve that person, get rid of that genetic history within that, you know, that lineage of that individual. Oh, okay. I see. You, you wouldn't want to touch my family history. I, I, <laughs> I, I have done my um, my best on ancestry dot com, and my gosh, I'm uh, one strand. I'm back to one thousand BC. Oh, cool. <laughs> in, oh, that's in cool. Ireland, wow. and they're all. If it wasn't for a, a book on uh, the great kings or, or uh, high kings of Ireland, um, it, it, it's almost getting back into now where they have the names and it's bracket legendary. <laughs> so mm. it's like, well, did they really wow. exist or just from a story? But a lot of them <laughs> died of, of metal poisoning, like a sword uh, from the throat. <laughs> and uh-huh. so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was like, okay, I, I try not to get executed in this lifetime. Um, <laughs> you do this now. Uh, you have clients that come to you and um, and and look up your help uh, it, it, do you have a thriving business where you are I do actually um, I take cases from all over the country um, I've lived in a few places and so you begin to develop um, uh, that kind of a following, but also it comes through referral or where I may be advertising at the time. But it is a thriving business because, and more now than ever before, because I want to say back 25 plus years when I sort of began this, it wasn't um, as prevalent of a medicine as it is today. I think you have people that are looking for answers and I want to say 75% of the people that walk in my door or that I take cases from by phone um, will say to me, well, I don't want to be on any type of, uh, you know, traditional medicine. And I say, well, that's great because for me, what's important as for other practitioners in holistic medicine is that I want to find the root of the problem. I want to go and and look at everything that's you know affecting an individual but there's a, a, there's a root system just like in a tree you can chop a tree off at the ground but the root system is still there and it will rear itself up at another time where stress or something else comes into play so you want to peel that and and get rid of that out of the person's system so that that doesn't show up again. And that is a possibility with homeopathy because it is an energy medicine and it has the ability to alter DNA, which mm, there's not a lot of uh, types of medicines that are that way today. Mm-hmm. And we're not about masking. We're about healing. And there is definitely a difference. We don't want to palliate if we don't have to. Some things you might have to, but most times or more times than not, that's not what we're looking for. Now, when you said altered DNA, how does that work? And how do well, we know that? It'll strip away what's what's in that DNA. So in other words, like I mentioned about cancer before, so you can change the dispositioning of that person uh, coming down with cancer later on in life. Um, Say the mother, the grandmother may have had breast cancer. And so the person comes in at 32 years old and says, "I I don't want to get this. I don't want to become my heritage. Yeah, I wouldn't either. So we want to work to heal that. But there's in the case taking that will somewhat become revealed based on who the person is and how they exhibit their symptomology. And and that's hard to explain if you're not a homeopath. But if you're homeopath, you would understand what I was talking about. There is a way to do that. So okay, because I was yeah. I was wondering if the. the but, you know, do you check the person's DNA beforehand and no. afterhand and say, oh, no. look, it's changed? Okay. No, it's all, it all comes through by way of questions. And so we ask a thousand questions and many people will say, wow, it feels like I'm in therapy because there's a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. But those questions will elicit the right answers to tell us what direction to go in. Oh, okay. And yeah. what, which hearing, healing therapies uh, you can yes. go through. Yes. And for the listener, if uh, they want to follow along while they're listening to this, go to www. Home, oh, I, I knew I was going to say it wrong. Uh, homeopathy2.com. 
homeopathy.com yep. and that is Lori's website and you'll get a good insight of uh, what she does and heck what we're talking about now yeah. one of the things too it, the before we came on here we talked about something that was a form of homeopathy and it was gemo gemo therapy <laughs> yes therapy that's what yes. It was, yes what's that well, it is a form of homeopathy, but it's in lower potencies, and a, a potency is a level of of energy um, used in in homeopathy and gemotherapy, and it's used for cellular cleaning and regeneration of toxic cells. So, if, say somebody has edema, this is um, a slower gentle uh, way to eliminate this from the body or somebody may have a muscular problem so this is or or any type of problem that is needed kidney dysfunction um, anything but it's of a lower potency level usually used in a 1x form and it's taken over a period of time and it slowly regenerates that cell structure so it's made from, if you can understand, as children are growing, they have, um, like in that first year of growth, a baby from zero to one years, they have a very high um, maturation level. Their, their growth is huge. And so the same with a, a plant, a tree, a bush, whatever. And so at the highest maturation level of that particular plant, a certain part of that plant, whether it be a bud or um, a seed or, or part of the, the plant itself, will be taken and, and made into this low-potency level. So I use it, people with migraines and things like that, it's fantastic. So um, I love it in conjunction with using my homeopathy. Mm-hmm. Oh, perfect. Um, one of the things, and again, you were talking about a, we had talked about a cell regeneration and immunity building um, yeah. the machine, or part of the a thing called Rife Therapy. Yes. And I understand that it's controversial and it's not something that's um, widely used and talked about in the United States, but I know it, it does exist in other countries, and since we go out to other countries... Fill out mm-hmm. other countries in. What is the Rife therapy and what kind of machine is used and what does it do? Well, I'll, I'll start back in the history. It was invented by Dr. Royal Rife, and he was back in the 20s. He first invented a telescope, a uh, microscope, sorry, um, that could actually distinguish cancer cells as being virus. Now, that's news to some people and others it's not. But in our culture today, as a holistic practitioner, we understand cancer to be a virus. And it's a virus um, that goes out of sort of in a chaotic form in the body. And then the cells begin to follow and and generate that way. And then you get a mass and, and then you have cancer. So he finds this in the microscope. And then he builds a machine that can actually eradicate this. Um, and I want to be careful how I handle this, but um, this machine, uh, um, it emits electrical impulses with different frequencies. And each illness, each problem for the person has a different frequency. So it's just like channels or radio stations. If you're going to dial in a country western, you want to dial you know, whatever that is. If you want classical, you're going to dial this. So each illness has a frequency and it varies with the health and disease. So the therapy is based in the principle that diseases can be treated by tuning into these particular frequencies that are emitted with um, by this disease causing agents and systems within a person. And then um, continued uh, use of this you can feel or the change begins to happen. So I've used it on myself many times, numerous times for, uh, say, I was working in the garden and I my back was sore or I had a headache or or and I just put these electrodes on the pads or hold the cylinders and turn it to whatever the problem is. Say it is a headache um, and a lot of times headaches are caused from toxins. So what it'll do is you'll pl- 
turn it on to a certain frequency for a certain amount of time, and then it emits this um, its frequency, what it's doing is it's destroying that. Now, at the other part of that is you want to be able to flush that because the toxin that that microorganism um, leaves behind you don't want that to stay in your body, so you want to flush it with water. So the other part of this is you must drink a lot of water with it to flush your system. So um, I, I've used it for, oh, I don't know. I, I purchased it when I was seeing a lot of Lyme patients uh, back in the Northeast, and um, I find it's great for that. I, I find it's great for cancer, but simple things like headaches and such too. So um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to heal. Yeah, that is good, and I, I wonder a lot about that because when um, I, I took Reiki, um, I talked to a lot of people who do energy healing and sound healing. So this sounds like a 1920s version of just sound healing because it, it sounds are frequencies. Right, exactly. It's all vibration. So if you if you n- understand or think in those terms that everything has a vibration, some are lower density vibrations, other are higher, like tuning in and hearing something is of a different vibration than if you were to touch someone and feel their skin. That's a lower vibration. So everything being higher. And then there are think about a dog whistle we can't really hear it in a, a human um uh hearing but an animal can hear it because they hear uh, a maybe a higher tune of vibration so everything including microorganisms and diseases um have also vibration and so it's a matter of matching it and then being able to tune in and destroy it much the way if you took a glass and you had an opera singer, and she reached an octave, it would shatter the glass. Just kind of like that, if as an image. Okay. Yeah, so it's just, it, it, is, it is just then getting into discovering what vibration or what frequency aligns with what illness. Exactly, and I kind of think uh, gemotherapy and homeopathy have a very similar um, thought process that way, yeah. No, oh, now if I can just go to my physiotherapist when they hook up the little ten, <laughs> TENS unit and say, look, just try to find a good frequency without shocking me off the table. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, talking right. to Lori, we're talking to Lori Wheeler. Uh, go to her website again. It's home. I, every time I go to well, it. here's here. I'm just going to say this, James. Yeah. What's e- might be easier for people if they don't know how to spell that? Just www.wellnesswithin.net. That's oh. an easy way to find me. Okay, www or triple w wellness dot net. No, wellnesswithin dot net. Wellnesswithin dot net. Yeah. So the wellness without that would just be up to them to do. <laughs> uh, wellnesswithin dot net. Uh, right. Lori Wheeler, thank you. Uh, um. We were, or I was wondering about the way you deal with people or way you help people from, uh, like from your home where you are via Skype or something like that. Is it just, uh, you sit down, you could sit down with somebody who's a thousand miles away, have your interview, come up with a a therapy for them and, um, then just monitor it from your end and, and check in with them and then send them off to, you know, to the homeopathy store to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there aren't too many homeopathy stores around in the local neighborhood. So usually what I'll do is I'll take the case. I'll come up with a, a good, well-chosen remedy for that. I can either send it or if it's, cumbersome to do that depending on where they are located they can order it because if they're in europe they can purchase an order there if they're in the u.s they can even mexico when i lived in mexico for a while they can purchase there um, but it can come through mail it is not that difficult it's very user friendly that way oh perfect yeah it, it's good it's, and you know as, as long as it can come through the mail jump yeah a country, jump a border yep. without being picked off that should be good um, yeah. Now you have one of those uh, machines, the Rife machine. I, I do. I actually oh. do, and I use it quite frequently. It's it's wonderful. Now, are these big and cumbersome, or take up a whole room, or is it just a small little? Uh, um, it piece? depends. 
it depends on uh, there are some machines that are larger than others. Mine is is maybe about six inches by about nine inches with dials on it um, and or a dial on it and numbers, a keypad. And I just punch in the numbers um, according to the books that I have. And I have one book. um just trying to think of the name of it. It's it's what I call my Bible. Uh, it's probably about three and a half inches wide and thousands of pages um, of information of diseases and their frequency numbers. Um, and, and just filled with information about the particular disease in that. So I use that a lot also. Oh, very cool. I think and I believe this is the type of machine that my friend with Lyme disease would go over to Europe, uh, the one that was actually a pretty big one. Um, mm, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, um, it sounds very interesting. And I guess you, I think you can pretty well buy them online. You can uh, get them online. You uh, just have to find the right place to get it, that's all. Oh, because there are some fake Rife machines out there? Uh, I, they're not so super easy to find in the U.S. Um, they're limited. Uh, but... I, I purchased mine. Um, you can get it out of the country. It depends. You have to just search a little bit. Yeah, but it, well, they're you know when you say that, that they're not really supported in the United States. Yeah, it isn't uh, something that's illegal in the United States, is it? Um, I don't know if it's actually illegal. I never really checked to see if it was or wasn't. Um, I, I don't know that exactly, uh, but. I use it, and so I think, you know, um, I've seen people heal with using it, and so for me, that's my bottom line. <laughs> yeah, and that's and then what it comes down to, whatever works for you, right? Right, right. Yeah, and it is uh, it is interesting. I just Googled them. You can actually get them online. Yeah. Have them mailed to you. So, it's, again, it's just getting the uh, getting one that's not uh, made in some back room. In, in exactly, and, yeah. And uh, with three batteries in it, and... <laughs> by people who are giggling all the way out the door when they're selling them to you. Uh, but they're not that expensive. And if you know somebody with one and it works, people, uh, yeah, maybe you should look into getting your own. They're, uh, they're, they look like they're, they're something that would definitely help you. And again, it comes down to if it works for you, then that, who cares as long as it works. Right. Uh, well, works, we do have yeah. a little bit of that difficulty in this country, but there are other countries that are much more open to that. But that's the bottom line. If you're ill with something and you want to feel better and, and this does destroy those microorganisms that make you feel terrible, then that's, you know, it's your health. So, yep. And it's a lot nicer than a jar of leeches. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure, this leeching, it, it'll catch on someday. Lori, when you first got sick, um, you had the illness actually affected things like your memory and um, certain abilities. And mm. this was kind of counterbalanced as your intuition and more of the spiritual side opened up for you. Mm. Uh, what did? How did you accept that? What was going on when all of a sudden this was, okay, I'm not feeling really well. Who the heck is standing in my room? Um, or, or who were, like, uh, the, like your, your change, your, um, what we call it an ascension, your ascension hit. How did that mm. affect you and those around you? Well, at first I didn't understand it because I only looked at illness as being, you know, a physical problem. So, um, you know, I, I, searched and and looked at it from that perspective but simultaneous to doing that i had a happening where i lived on this land um this land that we purchased to build a house on um one day i was in my backyard so to speak um we lived um we had some woods behind us some acres behind us and i was in the backyard i um just was sitting there looking at the sky and suddenly i had this overwhelming feeling to walk into the woods and i walked into the woods and there was this beautiful big old pine tree in our in our woods uh, my kids used to ride their atv around it play up in it i don't know it was just it called you and 
I just walked into this area of this and leaned up against this tree and I felt like I was teleported to another time. And this time was such that I could see um, I, I could see what was happening in that time. And lo- I'll just tell you the little story of it because it's sort of in pieces. So the story was that um, where I lived was heavy Native American land. And it seems that this particular piece of land we built our house on was I, as I was informed, native burial ground. And so that in and of itself was um, the opening. And there were two tribes that lived in this area, one on sort of this land where I was living, and then a very smaller scout tribe had come and, I guess, attacked this tribe, this other tribe in the, in the night and had killed many many of its people. And so there were many people mourning and there were souls that were lost on this land. Now, mind you, I didn't know about any of this. This was a new introduction to me. I I was not aware of any of this. And so um, when all this happened, this feeling that I had by leaning up against the tree, I felt I was teleported to, if you can imagine, to a funeral or, or yeah, I guess you would call it a funeral where hundreds of people had died and where there were so many people mourning and it all went into me like, like a, like it sucked in, like, like I absorbed it all at that moment. And it was overwhelming to me, but that being at a funeral where I didn't know anyone. So if you can just do the imagery, it was very odd and and disconcerting and didn't understand it. And so this was the beginning of my learning. And spirit decided this was the way I was going to um, learn this. And so it began to open my my curiosity, because by nature, I am a very curious person. So I started to want to learn more about it. And Having been born out in Montana in Great Falls area and visiting my grandmother up in Canada, which up, went up into Alberta, there were a lot of Native people. It was not an uncommon thing for me to have seen or been around. Then my curiosity became more about the understanding of Native culture and wisdom, and it just began to open that way for me, and spirit started to teach me things and 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 tell me that I had certain gifts, and it just walked me into the process. Yeah, that, that's amazing, actually, um, to have that type of awakening in the area <laughs> that busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was. I, I've only, uh, you know, I've told this story to so many people over the years. I've never met anybody that's had an awakening like that. Never. So it is kind of unique and different. Yeah. Are you still growing in that in that sense? We're always growing as souls, but I have learned so much that now I'm actually writing a book to share what I know because I feel that we're in a time of awakening and that people each day are are waking up and and wanting to know. And so I'm hoping that my book will be able to share that information with people. Oh, perfect. Now, part of the part of the things that you do through um, your business is you you do past life regressions or help people through past life regressions. Did you have to then become a hip, a hypnotherapist or you take some training in how to hypnotize people? And Yes. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit because I didn't come into that first. I first okay. came into shamanic journey work and mm-hmm. that has been sort of my basis for this 25 plus year, years. Um, I began to channel. I began to work with spirits on the other side. They would speak to me. Actually, at one 
point I can remember them speaking in their native tongue. And for quite a while, I wouldn't understand what they were saying. But I know they were doing the work. I'm just the facilitator. So they showed me how to do. They they taught me how to um, hear them. But I had to form my own what I call dictionary of symbology, as we all really do if we're receiving information. And it's um, there are something called clairabilities, like clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. These are all different ways that um, we receive information through our senses. And so I'm very clairvoyant, clairaudient, and clairsentient. Um, so I... Again, through my symbology, if I saw something, um, I had to know what did that really mean. And I'll give you an example. I remember years ago working with someone, and um, in their in their body, I could see the energy of little tiny things moving around. I didn't understand what that was because I had never seen it before in my energy work that I was doing. But upon after finishing the um, the work with the person and asking questions, because this is how it begins to develop, um, the spirit doesn't tell you what it is. You have to form your own understanding of what the symbols are. So upon questioning, I, I mentioned I saw something like this. And she said to me, oh, I used to have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And that put two plus two together for me. I understood now what it was I was seeing. And so that's how you begin to build your form of reference. If you see something, you understand now what does that really mean? Um, somebody who's um, who feels it somatically in their body um they may feel like heavy in their lungs and and understanding through the symbology, the pictures that they're receiving, they may come to understand that this person may have been in a fire and it's very heavy in their lungs. Maybe there's smoke filling in their lungs. So so like this, you have to form this understanding. And this is this can take a while to learn how to do this. And so that's where I began to grow in my energy work and working with people and but I want to say the the biggest part and the biggest help that anybody can um, have is to grow your intuition and that's by being connected to spirit and and learning how to listen and for me losing a certain part of my um practical intellectual part of my brain which is the left side of the brain that opened up the right side of my brain capabilities. And so I needed that in order to follow my destiny into what I'm really doing here. What did I come to do? What is my purpose is to help people come into and grow and learn through this. So Now, when you are doing this and um, sorry, it's, it felt oh, it's almost like a word fellow there <laughs> when you're doing that <laughs> in this and, um, on your journey, what do you think, or why do you think uh, you have been pushed to where you're going? And as your soul grows, and as you become stronger, um, do you have any idea why specifically at this time, um, like in 2019, pushing 2020, your abilities are required? Well, that's a two-part question. So I do know why. Everyone comes with a purpose. Uh, if you believe and understand um, in reincarnation, we come into a certain density form. Uh, and I'm going to talk like it, it's, oh boy, this is uh, hard to explain in a bit of a way. So um, the life that we're living right now, there are, lives that are going on also our soul splits into different places and embodies in different places so you have more than one time going on simultaneous we think in linear terms like previous and ahead but that's not an actuality when it comes to uh, the spirit okay so it, when your body 
leaves or, or when your body your soul comes into body is what I'm saying and you live your life before you come into an embodied form you meet with your high self with which is a form of your soul that remains in the spirit realm and also um, your soul your your you have a council um, so these spirits will all come together with your your own soul, and you will sort of make a plan, a blueprint, a contract, who, what, why, how, all of those will be answered in this contract. Who am I coming in with? Who am I going to do this, this dance or this um, game with? Um, how is it going to play out? What time will it be? Um, all of this for your highest and best purpose, and that is about evolution, the the growing through the densities to evolve. That's what it's all about for no matter who you are, what spirit form you take, wherever. That's what it's all about, is the evolution and coming into source. So as that, I chose uh, to come in at this time to come with who I came with, my children, my husband, the people I know, the people I work with. I made a plan. And um, and my destiny is that I've done this before in other times, so I'm knowledgeable in some part of me of knowing of this, and I bring this forward. But there's a relearning again, because in the relearn, you learn more. You have more experience. It's more exercise within that, and that's what this is about. Out. So um, I know this in some way. I know this already. I'm just growing through it in this lifetime. And part of this is to help other people realize what they're doing, too. And yes. Their ability. Absolutely. But also my growth, too. So, yes, I help. See, we're always the teacher and we're always the student simultaneous. So I'm learning, but I'm also sharing what I learn. Oh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Have you keeps, been? It keeps you in a humble place. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, have, have you been in a position where you've bumped into somebody who's kind of at the beginning of their awakening and kind of seen how they go through it? And yes. <laughs> yes. What's that like? Well, that's interesting. Um, it, it's sort of being like um, when you're a teacher and you start with maybe a kindergarten student. So you have a lot of knowledge and and as a person, you have wisdom to your age and what you've done in your life. And you're just teaching this young person. So when, you know, I was teaching my children when they were born and growing um, in that way. Many years ago, I was in real estate and um, I worked for an agency and I had my own agency and I loved teaching people um, who were the agents to to learn how to use their intuition in in their work. And so I've always been a person that's been helping people that may not know something, whatever I know, I would like to help share what I know with other people. But sometimes it can, you know, be a little frustrating, but I always remember that this person is just where they are, just like I am just where I am. I know no less, no more than where I am at the moment. When you when you're helping other people uh, uncovering what their intentions might be, um, do you see? Uh, I, okay, I'm gonna, it's the easiest way because my, I'm I, I, I'm kind of uh, dumb this way. But uh, do you see okay. what the future for them? Are you given a glimpse into what they can become? Oh, that's an interesting question. So the glimpse that you're talking about, that's the realm of the upper world in shamanic terms. And that's the realm of what's possible. I don't really think anyone knows what somebody can become. And the reason for that is is life is constantly unfolding. And life here on Earth is all about choices and perspective. So you can go left and get one happening, and you can make a choice to go right and have another happening. 
And you may not know what that answer will be till the moment you get to that point and make that choice. So in in like with um, past life regression, um, the person will then understand certain things better. And from that point, they may make different choices having known certain information, whereas before they might have made a different choice. So it's a constant unfolding. And there is really no definite set plan. You come with a plan, but you have so much room and freedom because of your choice making. So you may not even fulfill your contract that you come into the world to do because, I don't know, let's say um, – you're just in a job that really isn't going to go anywhere. So that's where you decide you want to be. There's no wrong or right to it. That's just what you chose. Or you could be the type of person that decides, but you know what? I don't want to stay in this job. I'm going to go for this job. And you may exceed what you came in to do. It's all in the realm of choice. And that's what being in this, this earth place is all about. Oh, okay. And that darn free will gets in the way. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, we, you touched on uh, past life regression there. Uh, I had a pa past life regression done, and I asked specifically for spe well, I asked specifically for a specific time, and I learned out of that glimpse into that life i understood why i i could recognize certain world war ii airplanes mm -hmm. as well as i could understand why i am absolutely hate cigarette smoke <laughs> um, yeah. because that's what killed me i was mm -hmm. a heavy heavy smoker and died in a hospital in germany after the second world war of respiratory problems due to smoking uh the only thing i was upset with really i had this wonderful head of hair that i don't have anymore the um <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny too, because I I was bombing England while my dad was bombing the Germans in France, so we were kind of flying past each other at night, I guess. And mm. so, so yeah, there goes my, there goes my dad. Hmm. But, yeah, uh, yeah, that's it was, not it, uncommon, actually. Yeah, it was it was very very it was very very um, uh, what can I say uplift not uplifting but uh, uh, really yeah good to know that you were with him it. yeah. Well, I was with him, and unless we actually got too close, and he would shoot at me, and I would shoot at him, I guess. Yeah, but, uh -huh. uh, yeah. It That's really not an uncommon thing, actually, to come back time after time with other souls that you're very familiar with in your soul pod, and just do different role uh, playing. You know, one yeah. time you'll be a father, another time you'll be the son, another time a sister, a, an auntie, whatever. But um, that that goes on all the time. Yeah, this time it was basically I was uh, the antagonist, and he was the <laughs> he was the, he, okay. I was the axi, axis; he was the a a ally. But uh, yeah, yeah, there was a few of us I think flying around that time. You've been doing the past life regressions for a bit, haven't you? I have actually um, been doing past life regression and between lives regression for a very long time in my energy work. Um, but I've, it's a, a difficult kind of thing to explain. It's not the way I do it today so much. In other words, I was the one who was seeing and experiencing and I could help the person understand it when I, um, would do the energy work them, with them. But depending on where that person was, the level, uh, in which they were working at or capable of receiving, some would not receive as well as others. And I kept thinking there must be uh, an additional way to get them more to have the experience than me. I mean, I could explain it and I could understand it. But again, it wasn't about me. It's about the individual having the experience. That's where the real happening lies. And so then I came into doing it more in the the way that it, I do it now with bringing a person into a hypnotic trance, they're the ones having the whole experience. I may be tuned into it and I'm asking questions. And even prior to actually the session, I will have uh, them uh, write out 
questions that they may want to ask their high self, that they may want more clarity to different things um, and and such. So um, then that will come through also. So they're the ones having the experience and I'm not having it so much. And that makes for a better connection for them. Um, and beyond that, then I can take them to meet their spirit guide, the master spirit guide. And also, and this is all happens between lives, between you, in, between when you, before you incarnate again, you go into this between life space. And, um, and then what will happen is I will also have a person meet their high self and the high self it is the spirit form of their soul and 85 90 percent of people when i ask what was the best part of the whole session they will say meeting their high self it is magnificent to know who you really are there's nothing else like it and that's where we need to be and that's where we really truly know who we really are and it is life changing yeah i had a a past life regression like the air force one but i had a reading um with a psychic that i travel with and to do the different shows with uh because we share the booth and i i was curious on like my spirit guide, the primary spirit guide, mm. which has always been described to me as by other psychics as being somebody who looks like they're from Egypt about 30,000 years ago, which is kind mm. of freaky because that's my dad's DNA is mm. about where from a, an a area about where the Suez Canal is. Mm. And it was first, um, it, that's its first little spot on earth showing up and it was 30,000 years ago. But other ones, uh, uh, other people have said, you know, that, that, that old Egyptian looking guy, it's actually an extraterrestrial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Said, oh, really? And then I had this, um, I met my, my primary spirit guide and it was me, but it's my higher self. Oh yes. Well, that happens quite frequently. Well, not quite frequently, it, but that so can it, happen too. It overlapped and I actually went to the planet and mm-hmm. kind of went in and, and saw all these other beings that looked similar and I, it was like I was absolutely dumbfounded as I'm walking uh, mentally I'm walking through this corridor and into a big hall area and a place to sit down and and then that's when mm. she said yeah that's you it's like oh, well this is kind of creepy no I, I, well, actually, but I had never heard that it's yeah, not actually creepy so let me well it might feel that way but yeah, it it's way. it's it's a more than likely, um, it's a sign that you are what we call an IP soul, which is an interplanetary soul, which d- is not a soul that comes from the earth, but comes from another place. When you, when you meet your, um, high self and it is your master spirit guide, that's usually, um, a, a fairly good sign that that's the case. As a policeman, we call that a clue. <laughs> yeah. It is a clue. It's a clue. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was very, very intrigued with that. And, um, mm. like, I get this, a, a lot of get this stuff from my mother. Like, I'm, my em- empath or empathic abilities, uh, mm. my intuition I get from my mother's side of the family and probably a bit on my dad's, but I get, uh, I, th- I feel a lot more of it from my mother. Um, but yeah, it was, I, it, it was kind of spooky. But um, it was like watching a movie when you, if anyone, if no one else has had any kind of regression or, or, or anything like this, it's, it's very, very interesting. And I, I tell you, turn a tape recorder on because you, you come up mm. with so much stuff. You're, you're narrating a, what you're seeing. And, uh, you know, at the end of it, you kind of think back, oh, crap, what did I see? What did I say? What did I say about this thing? And yeah, definitely record them. They're fascinating. What, oh, they um, are. Yeah, I record you, all my sessions. It, you have to. I think it's it's a necessity so you can go back and, and re-listen because uh, when you come out of a session, it's much like a dream. There's there's some of it you will not remember, um, and uh, so you, you'll want to have that information for sure. Yeah, this is beautiful. We're talking to Lori Wheeler. Uh, she does so much. 
uh, homeopathy, homeopathy, that thing, uh, homeopathy <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, you know, some energy healing work. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, now for past life regressions, when you do the, uh, the actual hypnosis. Now I know I, when I did mine, I was actually in a room with a hypnotherapist and mm. I have friends who can do them, um, over Skype and they don't take their client into the deep hypno hypnosis that you do when you're sitting in a room with somebody. They, they just basically get their subconscious to understand that everything's going to be okay. You're still in control. Oh yeah. And well, and go. that's true. Yeah. It, yeah. Every, all hypnosis is self hypnosis. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you're doing a little bit of a hypnotic, uh, trance work when um, you actually meditate. Anything that takes you out of your uh, beta brain waves, which is your conscious waking state, and brings you into different brain waves, alpha and theta. Alpha being lower and then theta being even lower yet. Okay, And theta is where you really access a lot of information. So when you daydream, that's a sort of hypnotic state. And we've all done that. So even children can do it. This is not anything that's, you know, rocket science. You can do it by just counting yourself in. Um, there's a lot of different ways. But you wouldn't want to do that for your own past life because regression because there's information to elicit. And you want somebody to be the objector to ask the questions and, and be sort of, um, I don't want to say in control, but guide and lead the whole process. Um, and ask the proper, appropriate questions throughout the entire process. And also, uh, you want to sort of tickle out some of the information and help that other person who's doing the, who's in the session it, to, to understand it in the deepest possible way. And then we release and let go. And so that's how the process goes. Yeah, I had, when, when I had my, in office therapy or uh, hip, hip, no, regression is the word I was looking for. There were times I thought the whole thing took 20 minutes. It took three mm. hours. Yeah. It took yeah. An hour that's right. To hip, put me yep. under and then two hours. And she said there were like 20 minutes at a time or 10 minutes at a time where I was just staring. <laughs> looking. Yeah. Yeah. And because she, you're she would have to say, so what are you saying? What are you yeah. saying? And yep. she would have to keep kind of keep you on me, task. Like, yeah. Like tell me what's going what, Tell me what you're looking at. Yeah. But I was, so, I was like you know, I just want to, you mentioned something about um, doing it over Skype. I want to say 50% of the people I do regression with um, are usually through phone work and there is no difference. I can yeah. bring people in. There's only a very minute, maybe a couple that I have not had the capability. And it's really not that I'm not capable. It's just they're not prepared enough to be able to go deep enough. So then what I will offer is a um, some practice work that they can do, and then we'll revisit it again. So this will help them practice to get into that uh, capability of that place where we need to go. So everybody can do it. And there is, for me, in my work, no difference whether you're in person or whether you pop those earbuds in and off we go. It, it's it, it, you don't even know that I'm not in the room. So it, there's no difference. So, Perfect. yeah. Now you yeah. also do a thing, it, you, you do the regression and you yep. also do something that you call lives between lives. What is that? Yes. So um, a past life, I'll, I'll explain you. You're going to go to a, a previous time. Um, and I just want to make a little note. We could also move ahead and go into a future time. It, you know, again, this is the concept of time is linear and it's not. So you're just going to go to a time. But anyway, for uh, this particular um, interview, name this uh, sake of this interview, we're going to talk about it being in a past life. OK, and mm -hmm. so you're going to go to this time. You're going to see maybe several different uh, times within this lifetime. Know who you're with. Get all the information that needs to be extracted. Then you're going to go to the death scene. And in the death scene, there is information, too. And then you rise out because the soul knows how to do this automatically. It's done this many times. It will leave the body, but you'll kind of hover. You won't go completely through and you'll and there'll be more questions to be answered there. 
And when we finish that and you've finished all the work that needs to be done in that past time and said your goodbyes and whatever needs to be to happen, then what we will do is I will take you to meet your spirit guide. Now, this is between lives, the spirit guide. And this is before you would reincarnate. There is you will meet your master spirit guide because you do have one. There are You have many guides and teachers and, and such, but you have one that is always with you. Some people want to call them guardian angels. Some people can call them all different things depending on how you uh, see spirituality. But you'll meet this guide. You may not see it. You may hear it. You may feel it. It, there's, it can present itself in many ways. And what we want is to build a relationship. So I may say, let's get a name from your spirit guide. And so there'll be some more questions to be asked about the past life, what you need to know, what you need to learn. And then at that point, when all of that has been uncovered, then I will bring you to meet your high self and now your high self may have information also for you but it is the experience of unifying your whole soul because that's what the high self is the part of the soul that remains in spirit form it's the part that remains the source energy and that's where all the illusion of who you think you might be um, your fears, your anger, your your sadness, all of that falls away. And all you feel is the purity of your soul, of who you really are, the authentic you. And that is magnificent. And then when we finish, and we'll, we can ask questions, then when we're finished, then then I bring you back into your conscious state. All of this is on recording what's so wonderful is once you have experienced this this experience between lives of your spirit guide now you have a relationship that you can always have you can always call on this guide also your high self once you have felt that this experience you can always bring that back in all I have to do is just mention the word and boom, I'm there. And I can feel this and it puts you in a different place. Your energy changes. Everything about you feels different. It's magnificent. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I love this. Uh, one of the things, I'm, I'm going to run this by you. This is like my commercial. But I've got, um, <laughs> I have for my podcast, I have a Patreon account. So if you were to go to like the front page of my podcast, the oracles with James Tyson.com, click on the Patreon link. And what I do is like for if someone wants to donate $3 a month, if they like it, their name goes on a list for a past life. Once a month, I draw a psychic reading, a past life regression and an astrological chart. And, um, yeah. So if anybody, you know, wants to do that, that'd be great. What do you think about yeah. that? And plus, if I get up to 2,222 people, I draw once a month for a trip for two, airfare accommodation and car rental to wow. some place that they might like to go off to check off their spiritual or paranormal bucket list if they want to go on ghost tours at uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. then we'll do that. Or if they want to go to an alien con or the ufo congress in phoenix will draw for that and if i fill up my list with 3500 people then those trips end up being international and they're off to scotland or australia or vice versa those people can come here but Ooh, that's one of the fun. things so what i'm going to do is i'm putting you down on my list and uh it's okay i pay for these um so <laughs> when i draw a name uh it comes out of the money that people donate like donate uh -uh. so i'm not asking for a freebie from you i'm saying i'll just uh get I, i'll put you on my list of people to um do past life regressions and things like that because that would be really cool oh that sounds great i i, I hope people do um yeah. i'll just mention that for the month of august i've got some special promos and um so if anybody's interested in finding out i can share what they're about but you can go to my website and um sign up and the information will go out to you it's a, a whole uh, promo um, for the month of august so perfect and that's yeah. wellnesswithin.net 
Right, exactly. Oh, this is perfect. Uh, now, you also do medical intuition. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you, you talk we talk about reading the symbology. Uh, sim- so, oh my gosh, my tongue! I haven't. <laughs> I've been away from the show for a while, and uh, my arch- and and by myself, where I'm not speaking out loud to other adults. So <laughs> I'm having problems with my tongue. Symbology of what's happening in the physical and um, in, in phys- physically, this people and connecting with people, and um, is that medical intuition is something that was just one of the modalities that kind of fell into your your utility belt of uh, of these things it, it or is it something that uh, you've uh, I know this is a weird question but is it something that you've actually always been able to do you just now identified it a little bit more I have a feeling that you've always been able to look at somebody and uh, maybe your kids and kind of known something was uh, a little off uh, before you actually could put out this term medical intuition on it yeah, I didn't know what it was. Uh, it came to me as um, sort of a, a gift and a, and a, a seeing. Um, it either comes clairvoyantly so I can see it as something or I hear something. Um, or, or somatically, I feel it also. Um, and I, But I didn't know what it was long ago when it first started to happen. And I would see things or I get a feeling of something Um not understanding it and that's why I spoke earlier about symbology being very important I had to learn that Um, but like I said earlier when I was uh, working with the woman who had the Rocky Mountain spotted fever I could see these uh, little microorganisms these little things moving around and they looked like insects to me in a sort of way and so now it's understanding what this is I did uh, um Uh, another session with someone and she wasn't even in the room this was through a chiropractor that I knew at the time and he mentioned her name and he said she was having some problems and immediately the visual came up of her and I saw a tumor in the back of her head and so I explained what I could see of what I understood now sometimes it's not that clear and sometimes we're not a hundred percent accurate we only can understand what you can understand it can be a little confusing at times um sometimes if in my work what will happen is the energy will not allow me to go farther until i get an understanding of what that is so in other words i can't read the next page till i read this one and i have the understanding because i have to then explain to the person what it is that i'm receiving as knowledge so um yeah, that's how it works. But uh, I've done much of it over the years and have a sense if somebody says something to me, right away I'll go to a certain part of the body if it's a, a physical condition and I'll see something or I'll feel something. And that's just how it happens for me. Wow. Uh, it, it It is an interesting ability to do that. And um, I'm glad you can do it and I can't. <laughs> and honestly that it's a lot of um i think it's a lot of pressure or it's a lot of um weight to carry to look at somebody and take even take a deep breath and look at somebody and go, oh my god that's they're not well well <laughs> sitting it, across you know, from you on the bus or something you you can look at it like there's a pressure i think i used to think of it years ago like that um i felt very uh very um uh nervous about being so accurate um over the years i've just developed more and i'm not really nervous about that and what that really is all about is trust everything in this is all about trust no matter what you do no matter what you think or or how you look at something it's all about trust and so if you're receiving some kind of information Like, for example, very simply, oh, I get this feeling like I need to go around the block again because there's going to be a parking spot. You can choose, okay, there's that choice thing again, to either go around the block again or just kind of what I call poo-poo it and say, yeah, no. You know, and everybody does do that from time to time. Even the best readers and um, 
spiritual people, they will still once in a while not listen. But as we grow in our craft and get better at it, it comes through trusting it, even when your brain says, what? (laughs) And believe me, my brain many times will try to override my intuitive sense, which is why I lost some of that ability very early on, because I'm a real thinker also. So I kind of had to push that aside in order for this to come through the way it has. Um, and sometimes it can be over a very simple thing like bring a sweater. It's it's going to get chilly. Nah, I don't need one. And then it gets chilly. Or to a very important thing like I may be channeling. I have a new guide I've been channeling lately. And there might have been one or two things I kind of had a quandary about like, what is this? You know, I don't understand this. And then I'll do a little research or just looking at something and two and two fits together. And I and it blows my mind because there's no way I could have thought this up. No way. So now that validates and my trust is set in completely. Yeah. And, it's, it, and that's the big thing I found when you're stepping into this kind of intuitive, um, open um, part of our lives is trust. Mm. Yes. It, it's getting over like, like, am I making this up in my head or yeah. trust to us? My spirit guides all took a holiday uh, for about four months in 2017 because I would do reading for somebody and then phone up a psychic to ask him if I would got it right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And my spirit guide said, you know what? Yeah, you're good. We're just going to walk away at this point. <laughs> so yeah, I had well, that's a learn. That's so. probably a learning growth at that point. You needed. You were probably at a plateau and needed to move into maybe a next level. And so that was the way they push you a little bit. You know, they say, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, they're they're interesting. They can be humorous at times, you know, in a funny sort of way. And um, and they're going to teach us. They're going to help teach us and so if that's what it takes to teach us then that's the way it'll happen now the soul retrieval part we kind of touch on the um the the physical illness but now this is more the spiritual illness um yes how do do we deal with that and um this describing or, or or give me an idea what you mean by the whole soul itself or having okay. a missing a part of the whole soul. Well, our, our, we're, we're never a whole soul completely because we are uh, fractured in different places. But there are good places to be fractured into. In other words, split. Like where um, I probably have part of my soul in another time and place and another time and place for a reason. Okay. But... I may have had a trauma at one point in one of my lives or something, and maybe a part of my soul has gone missing. And so the soul loss is a spiritual illness, and it causes emotional and physical disease. Or uh, many times I will hear people comment, something's missing. I, I, I don't feel like myself. Well, to me, that tunes me in to say, oh, okay, there's probably some soul loss going on. And and a good majority of people that walk the earth have soul loss, whether it be from another time or current time. But this is about healing of the spirit and spiritual matters. And so a part may go missing. And so then how do you, what do you just leave it there? No. Um, If you find somebody who does this work like myself and um, it, the design is to have a team of helpers. I'm not actually, I want to say, doing all the work. The helpers are also helping me. So I have um, a team, uh, if you can, and this might sound a little nutsy, actually, to the average person, but one of them carries a rope and a backpack with all kinds of things that you might need when you go on an adventure. Another one is a nurse who brings medical care. Um, And so so I have a team. And when I go in, the team is always with me. 
And um, it does sound funny, but if you were going on an adventure into uncharted territories, okay, and not knowing where you're going and, and going to rescue somebody or bring back someone, you might bring a team like this. I didn't ask for them to be like this. This is who showed up for me to help me. So the intention is what drives the purpose in all of this. So this intention is set ahead of time, and there's work to be done on both the recipient and myself ahead of time, and then the work actually gets done, and it's done remotely. I never do it when the person is in the room. And then there's homework for the person afterwards because, and I'll explain in a second. So when I go in to retrieve that soul part, I I have to ask questions. Many times the soul part is a child because that's where trauma sets up a lot of times for people. And so um, you have to do your best to want to get that person, that part missing, to come back with you. But when they come back, now you breathe that into the heart and into the third eye and into the crown chakra. And so that part comes back into that person. And what I like in um, the best part of it is that I always ask the person to have a friend if they don't have a really close friend that can be there with them when the soul part is retrieved and, and comes back, then to at least have an animal or be out in nature because the spirit way back when, when it was tribal times and this was done, this was a community action. In other words, when somebody became spiritually sick, the shaman of the tribe would go in and do a soul retrieval, but the community would be there to welcome that soul part home. And the reason is because if that person's not whole, the whole tribe is not whole, the whole community. What a beautiful thought <laughs> to to have this. Um, we don't have this in our culture, which is why I say at least to have somebody there to also honor and welcome that soul part home with and for you. Um, and if not, nature can do that or an animal can do that. And we can usually find some way to do that. And then there's homework, much like if you were bringing a baby home. You want to prepare for that. And then this is a new part of you coming back to you and um, that you've not had. So you want to do the preparation for that also for it to to welcome it back into your space, into your soul. So it's a whole picture and, and it's a beautiful happening. And then I always have people let me know what happens as a result. I want to hear um, because I'm always, uh, you know, I always care and I'm curious what happens as a result. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. It is. And I, I find it was interesting when you had the, when you were describing they had this team that comes with you. Um, <laughs> how do you how do you vet your team? Uh, like, well, yeah, that's interesting. Um, and my team has changed over the years, or the team can change depending on where I'm going to go in. So what I do is I have a special place I go into. I always have a – no matter what I teach in spiritual form, whether it be the shamanic journey work or whatever, I always start at start. So like a board game, if you're playing a board game, you start at start, and then you go out on the adventure of the game, right? Well, this is the same thing. Um, but in a spiritual form. So we start at start. And my starting place is a certain pictorial form. And I ask my um, my team to come in and help me. And so whoever shows up, depending on where we have to go. And, and they're the ones that choose me. I didn't choose them, per se. Oh, okay. I was yeah. curious if you had uh, maybe a little bit of a stinker come through one day and say, yeah, I'm going to help you. Oh, and, no. Uh, I don't usually get that too much. Good. Too yeah. much. No, <laughs> not really. Too much. Yeah. Yeah, your other guides will kind of point them out to you and help you yeah. on that side of things. You know, guides, the thing with guides and teachers and helpers is that they're waiting for us to acknowledge them and, and call on them. They've already chosen to be with us. And so this is one thing that I tell people that I work with. Call on them. Ask them. All you have to do is put it out there and then wait to receive because they're waiting. 
they're they're just sitting by you know the phone waiting for us for the call and when you call on them they're there they've chosen that job they have a task and that's their task and and like this with soul retrieval my team is this is their task to go in and retrieve missing soul parts well that's perfect <laughs> and i need one of those <laughs> just to help me find my own pieces uh, uh, left scattered through my life uh but, you know, I, I'm more conscious of them. Though. I can kind of go back and grab a few here and there myself. Yeah. I, I shake them out of my uh, bottom drawer every so often. Oh, there's a piece of my soul right there. <laughs> um, you also will help somebody. You'll take them through what is called the Akashic Records. Can you um, explain what the Akashic rec Records are for my listener? Yeah, um, the Akashic Records, um, each soul has its own record, but... Uh, and it's kind of like a series of books, and it's this series of books is a story of each soul, and and the story is um, the what I call the spiral of life, and it's recorded and stored energetically in what's known as the akashic energy field, and so. Um, Many times when you go into what we call the Hall of Records, sometimes it can present as a library. Um, mine does. And I go down the spiral staircase into the library. And um, my story book uh, sort of will glow or it'll be highlighted and you pull it out. And now what I love to talk about here is what's interesting is people are so uh, sort of intrigued they want to get into the book and find a particular information in, in one page or something. But I, I say to people, stop and just look at the cover of your book because you have a name. Your name is on the book. Take a look at the name on the book. It is a story in itself. And the book itself is a story. So before you even open it, there's a whole story about you and information to be elicited. Then based on your intention, you'll then the book will open and you'll either go into the book or you may go down a hall of records and open a door. However, you're going to get there is really sort of whoever's helping you along the way to get there. When I do the work, I usually go into a book. When I take somebody to go into their records or, or um, a time, we'll go in through a doorway. So um, it depends. It just depends. Now, now that Akashic record, that is that um, it's been described to me as, as a group of people who are getting ready. And we talked about this in the beginning, getting ready for your plan, the plan on what, what you want to accomplish in this, in this go round, in this part of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always picture them as being at some big, long marble table. I'll take almost like a uh, reading for a play. Everyone's got a script and they're all deciding what characters are going to play in the next play. Okay. Last time you were a pilot and you parachuted out of the plane and we all died. So I'll tell you what, this time <laughs> you're going to die and we're all going to do something else. But yeah. It um is it, it when you say it's like a series of books it's um it, do we always stay with that same soul group? You know. No. Okay. No. Well, um so it is um when you're looking at your own story book each chapter is a a lifetime, okay? So it does come sort of in a concept, okay? And now this is an earthly, you know, human concept, okay, that I'm, I'm saying this. I don't think it's an actual book somewhere in a library, okay? But this is the way it can be perceived. It's just an energy uh, field is what it is. But um, uh, when you talk about getting around the table, you have a council that will help you decide what you want to come and achieve now the more evolved you are um as a soul you have more um decision making 
And so your counsel and your spirit guide and your high self will take a little step back and say, well, what do you want to do? But the younger souls coming in, they need a lot of help, like, say, kindergarten, first grade. You know, they'll need a lot of uh, help in making the decision um, because they're new at this. So they need a lot of guidance. And those that are much older do not need as much Um when it comes to uh, a hallway, um, the hallway uh, that I'm talking about is I do that in a, the trance work so that we can pick one particular time that you'll want to go into and you'll open the door to that time. Or if you wanted to uh, go to another galaxy or you wanted to meet an extraterrestrial or, or whatever, you know, there's a way to go in. It's a doorway that opens for you to get into another plane within um, the spectrum of energy where you want to go. Um, some people may want to even go through a wormhole, but that may be too too far stretch for some people. Um, a doorway is simple and easy uh, to get through for, for many people. Did I answer the question? I'm not sure if I answered the whole question. Oh, yeah, I think you did. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, it the, the Akashic records, Akashic records, and the teams that kind of sit down as we enter each life. I've always been curious if we've dragged that entire team. Oh through, yes, you did ask that. Yeah. Yeah, through all the different lives, and uh, we're all so the end- turns trying to get a thing. We're all trying to get check off our own little bucket lists in each of our soul journeys. Yeah. So the answer to that is evolution. So you do come back with a soul pod um, and it's anywhere from eight to about 15 soul beings in that what's known as a pod. They don't all come back in one lifetime each time. You may come back with one. You could come back with four. It's different each time, depending on what's going to happen. And one could be the mother. The next time, the the other one could be the child or, you know, your your role playing, so to speak. And it is like a play. Okay, let's switch. Let's reverse roles. So it does happen. But what I think many people don't realize or think is that you eventually will outgrow your soul pod in your evolution and you'll come into a new soul pod. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, as much sense as all this woo-woo stuff makes. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard sometimes to wrap the brain around it, um, but that's just because you're looking at it in a logical way. And this is not as logical as you would think you would like it to be. Although... Yeah. The higher density you go, there is a lot of logic in the way those beings think and not as much emotion, actually. See, we look at many things through emotion as earth beings. But when you get like we're in third density, moving into fifth density, that's what's happening right now. That's why so many people are in having so much difficulty and you hear from everybody, wow, it, uh, it's so hard right now. Time is moving so fast. And, and that's because we're moving from third to fifth. But what happens from here when, when you've moved sort of through the density levels and you get up in the upper, upper realms of that, there is a logical way of thinking and not so much emotion. And so uh, it's just a different happening. And so what's happening here is that they're learning through us, through our emotion. And because it's there's so much emotion to be understood. And that's what's so great about the earth plane is that that's what this earth is about, is the emotional learning classroom. Now, when you say densities, that's the dens- densities of consciousness? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. You know, that's an entire um, episode in itself. Oh, gosh, it is. And yeah. who's out there and, and, and such. And um, this new guide I'm working with has been explaining a lot of information for me um, about all of that. So and I think it's because I'm doing some touring now, d- telling people about different information that it wants to he wants it to be really correct. And so he's come to give me a lot of the load down, so to speak. 
Now, when you say we are in the fourth density of consciousness or fourth density. No, we're in the glo- third. Oh, in the third? No, is that we're in globally? the third, in the fifth, going into the fifth. Yes, globally. Yes, whole oh, okay. earth. Mm-hmm. Um, all righty. Yeah, I was going to. We skip the fourth? Well, the fourth <laughs> is is not really um, super important. I'll just put it that way. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's the, um... the fifth density is about compassion. And if you can see, there are things that are happening in our world that are creating compassion. And that's for purpose. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah we yes. have to. If we're going to move into that fifth density, that's where we have to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's good because there's a sixth one after that and <laughs> a seventh. So at least we're not going to all die in the fifth. So we're going to get no. the compassion. Here. Well, here's the great part of this. Energy never dies. It can't die. There's no such thing. It just forms in a different form. So much like if people don't understand this, I'm going to put it in real simplistic terms. Okay, so you have water. Water freezes and turns to ice. Okay, then it melts and becomes something else. So it never really dies completely. Okay, it may evaporate and go into the air even but it's not completely gone. So kind of like that, that's kind of what how I would describe energy is that it just changes, but it never dies. Yeah. And it's just it, it, it's just there. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. We've been yeah. talking to Lori Wheeler. Uh, please if you want to um, talk to her yourself, go to her website wellnesswithin.net. Again, that's Triple W, Wellness Within dot net. Um, you do a lot of stuff, young lady, and uh, <laughs> really appreciate you coming on and explaining a little bit of it here to my listener. And uh, you also do a, a little twenty minute um, console, don't you? A free one. So for I do. Yep. Yeah. This is it's amazing, and I really appreciate you coming out. And it was really nice meeting you uh, and your husband at Alien Con this year. Are you going out to anything else? Any conferences coming up? I may be at the one in Texas, um, but I do have some conferences coming up. Um, going to be with 5D events um, coming up, but I don't remember the dates. I should know them. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't have them. If you want to know, uh, just send me an email and mm-hmm. I will be glad to send out where I'll be. Yeah. Perfect. You should... Uh, see if you can get out to Scottsdale in September for the Soul Summit. Yes, I might I might try to get out there if I really can. Um, my my August is fully booked um, and now going into September, so I'm going to try though. That is on my list. So Good. Maybe, yeah. Again, thank you very much and uh, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much, James. It's been such a pleasure and uh, I hope to see you soon. I get my book written and published um, maybe we can do this again because I'd love when this all kind of comes into actual fruition um, there's going to be so much information in it so I'm looking forward to it excellent thank you very much and yeah we'll definitely keep in touch and we'll do something something for your book sounds good James and I hope to see you again soon Angry Paul Thunder
Get the 